are clobbering. This might be a homer. This is high out and to left. It's over. That is going to be a homer for Justin Holland. We are going to see a home run in the final championship game. It is two for Justin Holland. A high popper into center that is going to be far out there just past Will scrambling to go get the ball. And yep, and it's another home run for Justin Holland. Wow. They're calling this another home run, I think. So that is two in one Justin game Holland. for Justin Holland. Two home runs in the championship game. Unbelievable. Rugs coming up, still waiting. Calling it a and home it run is. from Jason Price. It sounded like it was right between that 170 and the back line That's of 172. Home run. Home run it was game. just a home run, but I mean, to hit it 170 fo uh, 170 feet in the air is, uh, <laughs> is, is pretty darn hard to do. I've only seen Justin Holland do it. Hey, 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 Beep Baseball World, welcome back to the Beep Ball Blue Show for the final recap episode of the 2022 National Beep Baseball Association World Series. Neil Dog, Bam Bam here with you. So I thought we had five shows inside a one week period, like like we're hard working folk or something. Actually, I think you sell yourself short, or I guess the show short. I thought you were gonna say the final recap of the 2022 season. All right, because we've been doing recaps going all the way back to like April <laughs> or That's fair. First, first tournament that we actually did. This is just the culminating event. In the now expanded beatball, <laughs> so, you know this, that, this that's, is the final ten. Yeah, that's absolutely fair. Uh, but I, I guess I I kind of think that when we start bringing in all these players that uh, contributed to the 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 twenty twenty two season, they'll be recapping how they contributed to the twenty twenty two season. So. On, on some level, recapping will continue, but it's our final recap of the tournament, the World Series tournament. Yeah, well, the tournament season is what I was saying. I, I can't remember the first tournament show we re it was that that was a recap. Uh, what was that? Uh, not Bowling Brook. Uh, the Indie. Th oh no, the Hitters and Heroes first. You're you're right. We did do a lot this year. As yeah. far as recapping goes, but hitters, yeah. heroes, Indy <laughs> banana, Indy Thunder, Bonanza, the Bowling Brook, two uh, east, east of the east. That's what I'm saying. This is the final. You know, it was it was a, a season of of recapping tournaments. This this is the final one. <laughs> so, well, not totally because remember, like uh, Larry and Rosie Reed host that like Texas yeah, shootout or whatever. Right. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> the, there will be more. <laughs> we're not we're not done. So, our work's never done, Seth. Oh, yeah. Our work's done. We are promoting this league twelve months out the year, baby. Mm. Sorry, I had to get a little sip of Java. We were recording this early Monday. We said that uh, we were going to do our our last recap of the tournament on Sunday, but uh, our boy Frankie Porter travel was traveling home late on Sunday, and we preferred to wait, let him add a little a little mix at the beginning, add a little mix at the end. Uh, I was going to say more on that, but I'll save it for another show. We got enough stuff to cover, but uh, we'll go extend. I should talk to you about it first anyways. Going to extend a little invite out, out to our membership uh, music-wise, but we, we could talk about it another time. Seth wants more black music. I know that's racist. Uh, I, I, I had suggested that we play the the, the song, the, the, the new song that the Heat put out, uh, Heat It Up, Beat It Up. I, I actually still haven't uh, heard that. Not I'm not on a lot of times. I've had a hard time right. playing the songs that individuals put out, and I've had to get help from Axel Cox before just to play it. So I don't I don't always mess with that stuff. But I've I've heard more than one person say that it's a good little beat. Uh, but I don't know. In general, we've we've got a lot of people out there putting out music. So if anybody, I might as well we might as well just say it now. I was thinking if anybody wants to throw together some beats that we could use as intros and out outros 
you know, we're not looking, I'm not asking you to send me stuff you want us to promote, like, not that we're against that, but, you know, intros and outro, outros should just kind of be music, cool beats, a little something to get the energy going, so if people want to start submitting stuff, uh, you know, assuming that Seth and I both like it, Frankie likes it, we'll, we'll throw it in the mix and start adding more stuff in it, get people more interactive if they want. You cool with that? I know you are. <laughs> IAS Box 45. <laughs> 45. <laughs> no. IAS Box 45. <laughs> <laughs> These two brothers talk a lot of junk. <laughs> <laughs> Jay Paul, our dude right there. Uh, you know, I don't think anybody outside of uh, Alvin Suarez has any clue what we're talking about. Uh, hey, you know, sometimes, you know, you got to do the inside jokes, man. You know, it's special when we've been doing these sort of things for, I don't know. <laughs> I just, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just wanted to acknowledge the one person that knows where we're going with that. Oh, yeah, yeah, joke. Yeah. So done. <laughs> oh, I'm done. I'm done with the IS Box 45. <laughs> so, for this episode, I need to circle back to the beginning of our last episode. Oh, and this okay. actually is kind of embarrassing. It's going to have some egg on my face because people go start worrying that I'm not just blind, I'm deaf too. But the, uh, the little okay. beat I told you that the indie edge we're doing coming in off the field first off it wasn't the edge <laughs> second off i didn't have the words right <laughs> what was being sung <laughs> it, i heard from faith Penn, and let me tell you people faith the cold pen is a lovely person but don't get on her bad side that's my only warning to y'all don't get on her bad side I, I had some messages from faith and she sent them all in, in good tongue-in-cheek or whatever but the the cheer is the austin blackhawks and it was saying uh, right here, Blackhawks right here, right here, Blackhawks right here. It still sounded fresh. In my defense, it's bad when you're like defending yourself right out of the gate. <laughs> but I, I, I usually, I was, I, I was gonna question it because I didn't, I didn't hear the Indie Edge doing it not once yesterday. <laughs> You know, uh, the first thing <laughs> I, whatever that was, yeah, the it. first thing I sent back to Faith, I was like, you know. I was wondering why I didn't hear that at all yeah, yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I felt pretty stupid. I, you know, I had, as I've said more than once, usually two games going and at times three going all at the same time. And I would move them around like one device would be in my kitchen and my one would be here at the desk. One would be over at my stereo because I found that just hearing them all kind of to cluttered, it, I couldn't keep anything straight straight so i i in addition to the fact that i'm trying to uh sit less <laughs> trying to keep keep myself on my my feet more just for better health so yeah, i thought it was a good opportunity i could just kind of stroll around from device to device um as i was trying to keep up with the games <laughs> clearly i didn't keep up with the cheers and the songs well i came walking in and heard i only heard it like twice and i only heard it what i thought was clear once uh, and obviously, it wasn't too clear because I didn't have any of it right. But man, <laughs> well, shout out to listening, the Blackhawks. So while you were listening to, to the games and strolling around, getting your exercise, like kind of like a coach, did you go down on one knee when you needed a little rest and 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 you know keep the athletic theme going, or did you sit down? And no, there are times. Uh, there are time when I'm in that mode. Like even if I'm listening to a book or a show, I I just try to get on my feet more now. Yeah, I mean, I mean, no, I didn't just recently start. I've been doing that the last couple <laughs> years, but um, I, I, I just, you know, sometimes you just feel like sitting down. You get locked in. You're listening, and then I drop. It's like, oh yeah, back up, up, up. <laughs> that that's more the routine of <laughs> me, me yeah. just sitting down because I get tired of standing. It's like, no, 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 not enough. Back on your feet, boy. <laughs> You know, and sometimes with the the stress of my PhD and deadlines, I I would find myself pacing back and forth in, in the house, and I'd say, "Seth, you're about to have a damn stroke, man. <laughs> you need to sit down and relax." Well, now for me, I mean, I know that's a different thing, but for me, it's not a 
pacing around like what i mean i move around i pace around just because i want to keep moving you know feel kind of stupid just standing there i often i honestly have taken this so far that when i go out in the backyard just wanting to get some sun you know you know like previously i would sit out on my patio and listen to a book or something now i just stand out on the patio and kind of walk around and i wonder wonder what my neighbors think i'm just yeah, out there like a, no shirt on pair of shorts and flip-flops just walking around in circles on my on my patio paul paul come look at the blind guy yeah <laughs> there again I, know. I, know. Uh, I haven't gotten to my screen yet. I want to get over to my screen with all the notes so we can start going. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Set dog and the family are off to the Sacramento Zoo today. Yay. Yes? No? Yeah. No response? No, we're going to. You embarrassed? Did I no, embarrass I'm, you? I'm told, I told you that yesterday. I'm, uh, like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm like, shit, I, I, you know, I was a grown adult <laughs> taking the kids to the zoo all the time. That wasn't days for me. Right? So, when I, I could... want to go to the little kitty ride park uh, next to the to uh, the zoo. fairy tale town. Yeah, fairy tale town, man, and ride the roller coaster. Those were always the my speed of roller coasters. I'm not into the death defying roller coasters. I'm into the the slower, lower. <laughs> <ride>. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, my my parents, you know, no, not to sound like a little crybaby, but my my parents never had our birthday parties at Fairyfell Town. But my my nieces and nephews, all their grandkids, just about every time they had a birthday party, the grandparents had to pay for a big party at Fairyfell Town. <laughs> big, I don't know Cinderella Castle or something. I don't even know. They, they got oh, all kinds you know, of crazy you stuff. know how many drones and and expensive remote control cars my my parents have laid on on my children <laughs> yeah right <laughs> <laughs> and, and I told them I, I could just remember being a kid looking at the sharper image uh magazine just just dreaming that i would get a cool remote control car no knowing that they would never ever ever in a million years give me that but i'm, I'm glad i'm not the only one that carries yeah, that bitterness so let's start out by running down the placements of the team we'll start at 17 and work our way down to one as if nobody knows how the tournament well, turned you know, out my, my parents probably are the only ones that don't know and they do think you know no. You're big 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 show. fans of the show yeah you see our shout out that. from aunt cindy Aunt cindy gave us a love yeah, the other I day saw that. i saw yeah, that yeah pretty exciting time. you know you get back into beat ball you know <laughs> yeah all right <laughs> it was good to hear from her though all right here we go start out 17 the svg sgv san gabriel valley panthers our friends from california they went over and they they finished 17th which you know it's their first time <laughs> not not a big surprise there's their sacrificial lambs at the oh yeah oh <laughs> for the base oh for the ball <laughs> <laughs> uh, the old topeka golfer yeah, let me stop, man. Let me stop, man. <laughs> big shout out to the panthers man Number 16, the Braille Bandits, my friend, Catherine Trussell, uh, plays for them. They had a rough year, but they, they, they finished, you know, one spot above the bottle. So, shout out <laughs> to the Braille Bandits. I'm not hey. positive, but I think Greg uh, Lindbergh, play, he played for Long Island last year, and he's from Florida. So, I'm, po I'm not positive which team he was with this year, but... Uh, Greg Lindbergh of the Eyes Free Sports Podcast has invited me to come on and, and do a little World Series recap with his show. That won't be out till like Saturday, but appreciate getting invited out. Yeah, and, you know. and, and I was going to say with their finished one place above the the Panthers, I, I have always been a big believer that there is first place. And then everybody else ties. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not all our teammates always agreed with us, but you, you and I used to say on the regular, there's first in a tie for last. <laughs> <laughs> or if you're an optimist, a tie for second. It's all right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you're a glass half full yeah, kind exactly. of individual. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 15th place, the Minnesota Millers. I mean, I never expect Minnesota to like jump up into the top like five or six but I, I was surprised to see them drop down to, to 15 i think they're they're better program than that although they had a rough year last year too so 
maybe maybe it's time to bring in some youth. I'm not sure what's up with that. <laughs> the Long Island Bombers finished number 14. Gateway Archers, 13th, obviously a disappointed, disappointing finish for them after finishing, I don't want to say 8th last year, either 8th or ninth. So I know that, especially adding the pieces they did, Johnny <laughs> Walker, Demo, Ethan Johnston, uh, certainly didn't go. Go ahead. Were they all there? Yeah, yeah. Was Ethan there? No. Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah, sir. Yeah, yeah. Good tournament oh. defensively. I'm not. I haven't seen any like numbers. I don't know how he did offensively. Uh, but yeah, he Richie Crussell. They they had a, they had a strong team. Lost a couple tough games, but uh, you know, they're they're an up and coming program still. Like you know, there's growing pains. You can't expect somebody just because they finish eighth in their first year to jump up to top five in their second year. <laughs> it, it, like, not easy like to do. You would like them to finish around eighth again, though. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fair. That's fair. But I'm just saying. But it was good. I, I, I feel you. I feel you. The BCS Outlaws, number 12, not on anybody's radar for even getting close to the top 10. They they moved up. Shout out to PJ Navarro, fan of the show. Houston Hurricanes finished 11th. Number 10, the Atlanta Chaos. I know that when I had them still ranked on my own rankings down in the like seven, eight, nine range, everybody's like, man, what's wrong with you? They did this, they did that. And man, I like the product and I like the people on the team. I just didn't think that they were ready. They like the archers, had it finished right in that like seven, eight, nine range last year. And then they lost Justin Holland and they replaced it with Richie Flores. And I love Richie. Uh, but it, Justin Holland's one of the best, like, seven, eight players in the league right now, uh, judging by his two home runs in the championship game. Uh, you know what I mean? It's not, they, they lost a lot of punch. I knew Richie could help them defensively make up a little bit of what they lost in Justin, but he's not, uh, they, you know, there's not there's a couple people in the whole league that can hit like Justin, and you lose that. You, you lose a lot. So I wasn't convinced that they were ready to move up and – so I guess I'm a little bit not happy for their finish, but happy that I was right. I like being right, said so Doc. Not very <laughs> often. <laughs> Tyler Tigers, number nine. I had them like as a bubble team. I had 11, 12 range. So they finished a little higher. Congratulations to them. Larry Reed. That's that's one of the higher finishes for Tyler. Uh, I, I don't know what the absolute highest is, but they don't have a lot, tons of top 10 finishes. So that's a good job by them. I thought they popped up to eighth once. But I, it, in, like in I said, I'm not season. saying never. But well, no, I'm just saying we, not the, often. The, the Bay, Bayou City Heat, you know, has kind of a, a connection with Tyler yeah. and stuff, a co close relationship. So you always see them kind of make a little run, and, the, and it seems like the organization is turning around on an upswing. And then the next year they'll have a little, you know, a little slide back. Um, I, I, I don't think that I, I think they didn't do, you know, in the last couple of years, I don't think they did too bad. So I don't think you know, I think they have a great collection of players and potential, but they're kind of uh they're they're not all right from the Tyler area. Like three of their players come from the Cleveland Scrappers, yeah, yeah. and you got Greg Roberts, and he's there in Texas, but he's like in the Austin area. So I don't know how much they get to work together. And if you're not working together, you it's hard to you you could be pretty decent on offense, assuming you have a good pitcher, but it's hard to build a, de a defensive like core together without working together. You and I know that. Chicago Comets, number seven, right about the range where most people had them, as much as it offended the, the Chicago Comets, but they came in seven. Six, the Indy Thunder, obviously, uh, after their five straight championships, not what they're looking for, but we, we talked about it in the episode, considering just the, the, the terrible year they had off season, everything involved, that that's a pretty solid finish considering everything they lost, you know, they're not the same, they're not the same team. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, right. You know, they have the same, same picture, but they don't have the same team. Right. No, totally different lineup. And they, they got out there and, and where my concern with them early on, I remember, going back after the Bonanza tournament, I think it was when we had uh, Eric Rodriguez on talking about, um, you know, the Thunder 
having a good collection of players, but they weren't. Uh, they weren't a collection of players for the most part that played a lot and played deep into tournaments. So like the experience, they had good players, but the experience level dropped from what they had uh, sure. before, as far as like making a run at a championship, sure. you know, I mean, James Michaels, Toby Gregory, uh, some of these, uh, you know, Gerald Dykus, they've all been around, but Gerald Dykus is really the only one that was like part of everything. They were a big part of what they did the last five years. So I, I, I don't know. Shout out to them. They, they fought well through this tournament. I expect them to be back. Boston yeah. Renegades finishing fifth top five finish for the Renegades. Philly Fire, their highest finish in the history of their organization, finished fourth. Austin Blackhawks, second year in a row, they finished third, even though Seth Wait, won't ever did, give uh, them credit. Where, where did, hold on, where, did you say Bayou City Heat? Uh-uh. Yeah, I might have skipped it. They finished eighth. I, I might have skipped over them. If I did, I apologize. Okay. Uh, no. I just don't. I don't remember. I, yeah, no, you're I, right. I, I didn't remember saying where it. They finished. Yeah, I didn't yeah. remember saying it. So we were talking yeah. about Tyler, and then when I moved my cursor, I moved it too high yeah. and went right over the top of him. So I apologize for that. The Bayou no, City dude, Heat. I was like, man, when, when, when you were at Boston at fifth, I was like, wow, the Heat not, <laughs> not too bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry for that. I apologize. Yeah, no, they. <laughs> they finished eighth at that, you know. I mean, they had a rough year last year. I, I was thinking overall, because the Value City Heat last year, I don't remember if it was 12th or 13th. That, that, that They and Philly Fire were 12th and 13th. I don't remember who. I'm sure uh, the Heat were 12 and Philly 13. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what it was. Um, so for them to move up to eighth, considering like the team divided in, in turn, uh, they basically, the group they had last year turned into two teams sure. and both of them finished in the top 11 higher than what they finished as a, as a group last year. So that was a little bit surprising. I'll be honest. I didn't expect much out of Houston. Like my very first ranking, I had them as a bubble team, but they had more to do with like Tyler Cashman, uh, uh, being added to their roster. And then they played a practice game where they just weren't scoring any runs and i was like man tyler cashman or not they they don't i don't i didn't think they had the, the offense to have a good finish but they stepped up i'd never expected they would be higher than like 15 so not that 11 is great but they they'd had a higher finish than i predicted <laughs> for whatever that means Five, so i'd gotten up to austin right number three yeah you were right there you were right there yeah so austin blackhawks second year in a row top three finish San Antonio for the second year in a row. The San Antonio Jets finished second runner up to our first time champion of the Indy Edge. Went 7-0 and in the tournament. Uh, they were in a run roll in every game except for the championship game. The final score was 19-8. to Justin Holland, who we were, were just talking about, hit a home run in the first inning of that game. Hit a home run in the fifth inning inning of that game had an impressive game and i gotta give a shout out to rosina uh, rosina foster and matt wallace that do the game of the day streams I, I won't say rosina called it in the air like oh that's a home run for sure but it was the first time i've ever heard a beat baseball home run be like predicted to be a home run because like uh, with our it's a line out on the field 170 feet out yeah. it's not a fence that an announcer or an umpire or anybody else can watch and so in the air rosina's like oh that's got a good chance of being, yeah. being a home run and yeah no, she, that's what i heard that that was good yeah real question that. first where did the edge finish last year fourth right behind oh. uh they and austin um had a really like tough game at the at the uh, towards the end of the tournament, and that that put uh, with Austin winning. It was a close game. Austin won, and that that dropped the edge out. And that 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 game was what caught when we had the conversation after the World Series about the jet or the edge losing their cool. And that, oh. that that conversation was sparked from that because at the end of that that Blackhawks game, things got crazy a little bit. Seemed like uh, oh. uh, on their sidelines. So, um, but no, they they obviously. I mean, they, it, it had the edge not 
finished first, it would have uh, it would have been disappointing, or not disappointing like for us. But I mean, I, I you know, you put that much talent together, there's expectations, and they lived up to it. Yeah, no, I mean, in the end, it wouldn't have been. I mean, it, it's kind of what you want, right? As a, an underdog to be able to beat a a, a better team, um, but obviously, you know that that that's. Uh, that that doesn't generally happen. Talent generally wins out, and and without a doubt, this uh, that this was an example of that. But you know, and, and you know, everybody points out Justin Hollins, and 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 of course, that's great and all that stuff. But you know, where where I look at it is Eric Rodriguez, right? In that first inning, when 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 the when the rookie picture, pitcher actually put what was getting hits, they were ground balls, but Eric Rodriguez sucked them up. And, and shut him down in the first inning to kind of, you know, set set the tone for, uh, you know, wh- where the 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 game was going to go. So, um, I I agree but, with you, but you know, I wanted to say this uh, when we did the show Friday night because you know you focus a lot on Eric Rodriguez being a factor on defense, and I know you're right. I mean, he's the he's the best player in the whole league. Yeah. Um, he was a defensive MVP, you know, a little uh, secret <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> I mean, not a secret. Uh, I don't know what I was just saying, but um, you know, letting it out out early. But I'm sure everybody already knows, anyways. But um, what I almost pointed out that night, but it, it goes beyond Eric. Like they have four players oh, yeah. on it just in the starting oh. lineup, and they got Ja'Cory Wiley sitting on their bench. All players that are like capable of playing, like. Oh. Big spots on defense. Justin Holland and Nick Mulheron were have been defensive all stars. Or uh, um, Corian White is turning into oh, yeah. a phenomenal defensive oh, player. There. Mark Morris, though he gets moved around on the field, whatever, fills different roles. Phenomenal defensive player. Like it's it's more than Eric Rodriguez. There are no oh. holes on that defense. No, no, without a doubt. I, I, a, I pointed out a, Eric Rodriguez as a stabilizing factor, yeah, yeah, as a yeah. championship winner in the um, in our in, in when we talked about the game. But B, it was him who made those first few putouts. And and you know, yeah, yeah. right when you when you're a better team <clears throat> and you give a you know cause, cause they were a better team than the Jets. Right. And you give a, you know, a weaker team, but still, a, you know, a dangerous team, hope or life. Right. Um, it, it, now you you start playing with fire. But once you start to just shut them down and so like those shutting them down in that first inning after, you know, the the excitement of a home run and all that stuff. You know, yeah. that, I mean, it, deep balls a, an emotional game, you know, it's a so. So, I, yeah, I, I, mean, yeah, I mean, that's why I, I, I focus on him just his his performance in that first inning was good yeah and 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 i certainly like wasn't trying to correct you i more than anything felt like the rest of the players deserve like i thought it the other night uh, like the other players deserve like getting their credit too that's a great defense all the way around great players they're stacked uh I i thought matt wallace did a good job of pointing this out like throughout the 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 broadcast of the championship game like the big difference is like the the edge we're putting up you know three run innings on on kind of a regular basis as it went on and the edge I don't think ever scored more than two runs in an inning you know they just couldn't get yeah Jeremy Lopez stepped up I think at least for quite a while of the game had less strikeouts fewer strikeouts than um, Kyle Kennedy of the edge but. They, they, like you pointed out, they're just hitting everything on the ground, and you're right. not going to beat a team like the Edge hitting the ball on the ground. So, they, I, I think the Jets uh, have great athletes also and have a great uh, uh, product going. But, uh, you know, they, they need to, to work on getting the ball up a little more. <laughs> I, you know, they, they've shown that they can do it, but, uh, they, you know, you're just, you're just not going to win a championship game putting it on the ground. And um, credit to to Kyle and uh, and the edge as the game went on that that they, they they just kept building and they, their contact got better and better. Um, they, they saw it through. So congratulations to the edge. Uh, it's always cool winning that first one. And uh, a lot of players on that team: Mark Morris, Nick Mulheron, Steve Michaels, their coach. Uh, you know, people have been doing this. Aaron C. 
uh, you know, Sherlock Washington's won a championship with the dogs before, but I don't know. A lot of, a lot of Frank Porter, our man, uh, announced he's retiring. So he gets to the, from beat baseball, not from our show. Uh, Frankie gets to, to lead the game with the championship ring. So I don't know. I'm, I'm happy for a lot of those people. Yeah, you know, cool stuff. There, yeah, I, I, I was, I, you know, I, I, I think I, it's, you know, it's my hope that those who, who didn't necessarily get to play that much with the edge will, 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 will filter back onto other teams. You could see the, the difference that Nick Silver made with Philly, right? Philly that, fire. Uh, yeah. You know, the, just the, you know, we, Filter, not just having so much talent built up on one team. Those, those players can go out. A uh, Jacory Wiley, right? Of course, I'm talking about Jacory. Can go out and, and and help another team really compete and stuff like that. And so Jacory, another one getting his first championship ring. So shout out to our friend Jacory. I'm not advocating anybody going. Let's <laughs> so be clear on the record. Players, what players do, I, I've got no dog in that fight. Uh, 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 I just sit back and report. Uh, I, I, I just overall, I just want the league to be more competitive, yeah, yeah. right? This I think that the, the product is better when it's competitive. Right. That's why the NFL is so good. Right. They change their rules constantly to make the games closer. Right. I mean, that's what the whole point of the NFL is. And that's why their games are always so close. And and and, and they've just become a bigger and bigger, pro, you know, a, a league and, and overall product. Our our games, especially like this year, they were nothing but blowouts for the most yeah, part. They're they're you know what I'm saying. And, Dave, and that, Dave Benny's been reposting like some of the best games and he's going to be hard pressed to find more than, you know, like three really good games. I, I, I don't know what the number is, but right. there were not a lot of great competitive games. Right. And this is a great competitive sport. And I, I like you don't like to see that. Right, so, right. however, yeah. it balances out. Right, right, right. Yeah, uh, that, that's all I'm saying. Is, you know, yeah, fair enough. We want balance, we want competition so more people can enjoy watching the games or whatever all right um so let's run down all the individual stuff i want to start with the hall of fame uh, <laughs> i wasn't making a prediction i just threw it out there as kind of an afterthought to you in our last episode about how many kansas players went in while it was in wichita right. were we going to see a whole bunch of texas <laughs> players inducted and sure enough <laughs> that is exactly what we saw seven Texas players uh, go into the NBBA Hall of Fame, starting with Zach Rambla from the San Antonio Jets. So he's still an active player now. He's had a great, uh, phenomenal uh, career, and he's still one of the best top, top, easy uh, top five player in our game now. So shout out to Zach. Dude, I've enjoyed getting to know somebody that you know a lot better than I do, Tanner, Tanner Gears. It's gears, right? So with the computer saying gears, I always uh, I never know if I'm saying right. Tanner Gears, who's been a great offensive player for the Value City Heat for the last few years. Any thoughts on Tanner making it in? That's your teammates? Oh, you know, it, it, it was just a matter of time. You know, Tanner yeah. is hard. Tanner's fast. <laughs> there, Got some upper. pop in that bet. Yeah, he, he has a he has an uppercut swing. The ball's in the air. Yeah, he's fast. <laughs> you know where I'd like to give him some extra credit, though? Because okay. in his accident, when he lost his eyesight, he also lost hearing in one ear. At least oh. I've always assumed that's how he lost the hearing in one ear. He does. He can only hear well out of one ear. And running bases? With, uh, look at all the bases that were missed this week with two ears. People are using two ears. And so to be such a <laughs> dominant offensive player with with not the best of hearing i've i've always thought that was pretty impressive yeah i mean it is i, I mean i've seen tanner miss some bases just playing. i'm sure you how can I'm he not it, <laughs> the, from, from the uh you know just from you know watching it um but no i mean he's he's he, he's a great offensive player nobody could ever doubt that he was going to get into the hall of fame at some point yeah absolutely another teammate of yours from the heat somebody we played against all through the 90s and then you became teammates with them in 2008 and i believe you are a big fan of mr daryl minor monster yeah. hitter of all these years yes i i and i you know i i, I assume you're, you're just doing it by alphabetical order but i 
slightly offended that he wasn't listed first. <laughs> um, um, I, I, they had it listed in alphabetical order, and these right, are the first right. three that um, came out the shoot. Right? Well, what, they were the only three that were at the World Series, right. so um, I, I really just copied it the way the MBBA had it. Um, right. No, and, and I hear you, Daryl Miners is incredible. I always told Daryl, man, I would, would when I grow up, I won't be Daryl Miner, but <laughs> <laughs> Daryl Miner's a hitter, he's strong, he's fast, he can play defense. Um, you know, he he's an all around player, man. Daryl Miner is incredible, so. I know oh, yeah. he held yeah. it up. I know it held up over the years, but in the nineties, like late mid to late nineties, uh-huh. that dude was a monster on offense. Uh-huh. And, and I know it carried over. You know what I mean? He's still playing now. It's still a threat at the plate, but uh, man, when he was like in his prime prime, that dude was a tough out. Uh, tough man, out. He, he hits home runs. He's a home run hitter or yeah. was right. I mean, we hit off Fonte his whole career too. Or you know, uh, Fonte, Fonte has pitched to him during his whole career. I, I should say. Yeah. So, so, so some of some other some of us might be Hall of Famers if we got Fonte pitching to us. Whole <laughs> Your whole career. I just say it. But, no, no, <laughs> Gerald Miner, man, he's a beast. Power hitter, speed, defense, the complete package, man. Love all you. the all, all the years I played against him, I've never had a conversation with him in his his acceptance speech at the induction on Saturday. The most I've ever heard Daryl talk. The first time I <laughs> first time I heard his voice, really. I mean, I know I've heard it like on the sideline, but you, people are yelling, and I couldn't have even identify who who he was. So I'm sure I've heard his voice out right. on the field, but that's the that was the first time I sat down and heard heard Daryl talk. So, <laughs> congratulations, all those guys. These four were were not at the World Series to to accept or um, have a speech, but more players that you played with, John Kivito. I played with him. Another great, great player. Another great player. Do you do you know how far he goes back? Because I've known that name forever. I've never had a single conversation with John Kivito. I know you talk him up. He was a, a good offensive player, right? Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. It was a dom- dominant offense. You know, again, not just he wouldn't hit home runs, but just consistent hard hits. You know, all the time. You know, smooth swing. So um, speed, yeah, you know, speed. Yeah, yeah, solid speed. Yeah, good speed. You know, the, he, that's he what I thought. Slower, I remember. Right, he got slower towards the end, but no, nah, he was always good. And I think he goes back. Uh, you know, a, a, a ways. I mean, Daryl. Um, we say Daryl hit off Fonzie. I don't think that's true. Uh, I, 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 I I said that wrong, and then I changed I think, it. Yeah, I think Daryl started like right around the year I started, 88. 89. No, uh, what I was trying to say is that Fonzie uh, has had Daryl as a hitter the whole time. Like, Daryl's oh, yeah. been on the team since Fonzie came yeah. in in the early 90s. That, yeah, yeah. And so, so, Fonzie yeah. has had Daryl as a hitter his whole right. career, and that's what I was trying right. to say. But and I do I, and I do think Kibido stretches back. You know what I'm okay. saying? Yeah. That, that I don't know. He doesn't go back as far as Daryl, but I, I think he does stretch back into the 90s. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know, like I said, I know I've heard – I've known that name forever. Uh, we didn't play Houston a lot. Like right. when we were the dogs, so and, and we weren't going to regional tournaments and stuff. So it's not like I, you know, we knew the Austin team pretty good and right. Fort Worth somewhat, but I don't feel like we knew Houston really at all outside of right. Fonzie and Daryl. Um, no, and, and, and I didn't day. talk to I didn't talk to any of them either being, before I, I I became a teammate of them. You know, right. you know, Daryl talks about his like interaction with me is. Is, is remembering me like walking through somewhere, you know, talking trash, pushing people and stuff. <laughs> but that's it. So, right. But yeah, now keep it all. I, it goes back pretty far into the nineties. Nice. Uh, Bobby Lakey, another one of your teammates with the Heat, great uh, defensive player. Really, really, really good defensive good. player. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, Scott Hudson, someone I played with. Uh, I played with Oklahoma for one year in 2004, and Scott Hudson was part of that team. Hudson, though, uh, is from the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and he played with with Frank Mathena and Sam McKenzie, Roy Eubanks. He's like part of that group for years and years. Scooter, you might might remember them calling out to Scooter. That was Scott Hudson. 
Absolutely. So I, I, you know, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was a pleasure to get to play with him for a year. Great, great individual. His wife, Sherry, both, both great individuals. So uh, congratulations to him. Glad to see him make it. And then Juan Marin uh, <laughs> from the old Houston Bombers teens in the 80s made it. And I'll be honest, I don't want to bad mouth anybody, and I guess I won't go on too long about it, but it feels weird with Juan Marin making it in because of a, lot, a lot of players now, a lot of people involved now weren't around back then, but there were not many that believed Juan Marin was an honest player, for one. <laughs> <laughs> but two, I don't remember him being around so long that he had enough to make the all tournament team. When he was when he was in the tournament, you'd have like 60, 70 put outs. <laughs> and it gave people a bad taste in their mouth. Uh all the years I went to, you know, twenty plus years of going to banquets, I've only heard the defensive MVP booed when announced twice. And Juan Marin was one of those. So I uh, I don't know. I, it, I, if got, you... I got no idea. You know, he got, the only interaction I've ever had is the, the my first year the East Bay Blaze played played Houston, and after we won, Juan tried to come shake Don's hand, and Don refused to shake his hand because I, he didn't believe he was. Uh, he said, being honest. "I don't I don't think you're an honest player. I'm not shaking your hand," and Don walked away from him. Yeah. And that I mean, that was kind of the <laughs> attitude of the like nobody felt good about and nobody outside of Houston felt that good. No, I shouldn't say nobody. I can't. Yeah. <laughs> I don't the know. Majority I, of that's people, all I know. That's all yeah, I know. So. The majority of people that I was near during that time did not believe one to be a, a an honest player. So if he was and we we're all wrong, then he deserves to be in the Hall of Fame, I guess. But even that, I, I don't. I don't remember unless he played like in the early eighties all through that time and was coming up with MVPs or whatever, you know, all tournament appearances. I, I didn't feel like he played long enough to be qualified. I don't remember him being around very much like 88, 8, 87, 88, 89, maybe. But outside of that, I don't, he wasn't around that much. I didn't think. I don't know. Again, I could. That's yeah. not, my only thing is my only memory is 88. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it. So I got, yeah. Nothing. And he was the MVP yeah. that year. And I remember when he was named MVP, people were pissed off, man. It was, <laughs> it was a big deal. So I don't know. Yeah. Uh, anyways, I congratulations to the other six. I guess I'll leave it at that. <laughs> all, all the other six I know are deserving. So, man, congratulations. <laughs> And, oh, I got, and i, and I, and I am officially have no idea <laughs> <laughs> yeah so anybody that's pissed off just come to me um <laughs> <laughs> uh, real quick uh i want to circle back to the wool game the the um like the awards from the wool game were given out um on saturday night um, but Faith Penn, my buddy Faith Penn, who I don't want yelling at me ever, <laughs> it was the defensive MVP with three put out. And, and our friend Rosie Reed from the Tyler Tigers was the uh, offensive MVP scoring four runs. I, I don't remember if she got a fifth at bat. I know she was four for four, and I, I don't know if she finished four for five, or I don't even know if she got a fifth at bat. So, oh, and then, uh, Maddie Eliason, uh, Andrea's oldest daughter, and Mari Blumenthal uh, from the Gateway Archers were the volunteer. They were the uh, awarded the volunteer awards for for the Wool Game. All right, so let's run down the uh, offensive and defensive all tournament teams. We're almost done here at the offensive MVP. We had a tie between David Smith and Joe McCormick. Both hit 800. You'll see through these averages, Seth, that it has uh, stayed consistent with any time the tournament is in Texas. <laughs> the batting averages are astronomical. <laughs> I, I, I saw the batting averages and I laughed. I, was like, well, I saw the batting averages and the fielding averages. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> you're exactly right. The fielding <laughs> numbers go way down. <laughs> Not a single player with more than five putouts per game. Yeah, and, no. and the offensive numbers go crazy yeah. every time it's in uh, Texas. Every yeah. time. Every time. Go back and look in the numbers. 
<laughs> um, I, uh, you know, the other day I predicted, I was, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Gerald Dykus, uh, was off into MVP and what I had intended to throw in with that and never got it out was, um, I only had two names in mind and they were David Smith and, and, um, uh, who'd I just say? <laughs> Gerald, <laughs> uh, Dykus. Gerald Dykus. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, Dave, uh, uh, shout out to D Smith and, and Joe McCormick of the Renegades, uh, for, for their offensive MVP. Eric Rodriguez had the second best average, 788. Gerald Dykus, 786. Corian White, 727. Christian Keeley of the Tyler Tigers, who I believe is one of the three players um, that, that come over to them from the Cleveland Scrappers. Um, he also, he and Corey on both were at 727. And that wraps up the offensive team. Those are your six players. Congratulations to all of them. On defense, E-Rod, Eric Rodriguez had the defensive MVP for, a, a, and I know it's at least the second time in a row. Um, I, don't, I don't know if the, the streak of MVPs goes back further than two, but I know he has more than two. <laughs> He's, his, uh, his resume is getting unbelievable. But 4.751 for Eric, Mike Coughlin for the Value City Heat. 4.375. I was half. I, I like Mike Cogman. I've had a good time getting to know that dude. Glad to see him uh, step up and have a good year with the Heat. Ricky Castaneda, little meat with third best average at 4.2. Evan Van Dyne from the Minnesota Millers, always on the team. One of the most underrated players out there defensively. Uh, four, uh, four putouts per game for Evan. Mm-hmm. Is he one of those older players on the Millers that you were saying they need to get rid of? No. Uh, yeah. I mean, he's, no, he's getting good. older. He's been around for a while. Evan actually started out. He, he's, I want to say, like in his late 20s, maybe 30-ish at this point. Right. Um, so he was younger when he came in. His his dad's Doug Van, Van Dyne. Um, but, I mean, he just consistently just always makes the defensive all-star team. And he, he's rare. You rarely see his name thrown around, but he's very sure. deserving. Great defensive player. He's uh, he's high on the list if, if this all-star weekend um, happens in November. Like, it's looking like it will. He He's high on the list. Right? He'll, he, on the last rank, rankings, was in the top 15. So, he should easily, with this performance, uh, be invited to All-Star Weekend, I would assume. Stanley Griffin, our other uh, – I know he's from the Cleveland Scrappers. He had a great summer playing with the Scrappers this year in the tournaments they played in. He also averaged four putouts a game, rounding out our uh, defensive All-Star team. Yeah. Obviously, the all-around MVP, though we don't give that out, got to be Eric Rodriguez. You know, first in on defense, second on offense. Uh, that dude's just an unbelievable player. Well, can't argue with that. Anyway, Pitcher. Yep. Yeah, sorry. Sorry yep. about that. Pitcher yep. catcher award goes. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. What? Is it a new person? Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Pitcher catcher award goes to they listed Jared Woodard and uh Darnell Booker. They don't list the catcher for some reason, which bothered Book, and I don't blame him for that. The catchers always get listed. Not sure what that was about. Uh, but they listed Booker up there too, so he had to have pitched a little bit. Uh I never saw Book pitch, but I'm assuming he also pitched. <laughs> Uh, I don't. I don't know if that's right. Maybe just because he was listed as a pitcher on the roster, right. <laughs> they were being simpletons and just put him on there. But right. the Indy Thunder win the pitching award. The Indy Edge win the defensive uh, the the spotters award. And again, they didn't list any spotters. The only ones I know that they have multiple spotters on that team. The only ones I know are Leah Michaels and Lisa Gilchrist. Um, I, I, I apologize. I don't, I don't have the names of any of their other, uh, spotters, but they fielded at about 65%, a little above 65%, very solid defensive rookie of the year. He also made the defensive all-star team. Casey Krauss talked about him in the last episode. It's his dad, a rookie pitcher, Pat Krauss for the Philly fire. 
Um, but Casey Krause was expected to, to play well, and he did not disappoint making the defensive all-star team and getting named defensive rookie of the year, offensive rookie of the year from the Austin Blackhawks. Uh, uh, batted 552. Daniel Brock had an uh, awesome year all all year long. He was on people's radar, and he uh, he came through at a solid tournament. And they also gave a Rookie of the Year award to Jeremy Lopez, the pitcher of the San Antonio Jets. I think it's uh, deserving that our spotters and our uh, uh, pitchers are being considered for these Rookie of the Years. There were no, I don't know what this is about. Maybe they didn't have enough to, like, maybe they have some minimum numbers you have to have to, to qualify for for the Rookie of the Year awards, which to me would make sense. We have that for the All-Star team. But there are no female Rookies of the Year um, named. There's, uh, uh, what's her name? Delana Regan from the uh, Boston Renegades. Scored three runs for them. She's a she's a rookie, young 19-year-old playing in her first tournament. So I'll give her a shout out, but I don't have anything else on on female rookies. So um, I'd like to know if that had more to do with like uh, minimum numbers or if they just ignored it. <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't know. So shout out to all of our, our rookies for the, the great years they had. The last two awards, the Dan Tracy Award, goes to you know the uh, the scorekeepers umpires base operators um these these are the people who are uh, considered for the dan tracy award and deb brummer who was just recently on the show named to the hall of fame last year only our second female player ever to be named to the uh hall of fame Deb Brummer told us uh, on this show recently that she was going to be out there being working as a base operator. And Jason Price says that all the all the head umpires ask for her as their base operator because they never have any problems. So big surprise that a, a blind player makes the best base operator. <laughs> well, we don't believe that would be the case. So shout out to Deb. Congratulations. Very well deserved. Long time. MBBA member of thir- more than 30 years in, in, her, in her back pocket. And then the Jim Quinn Award went to uh, Steve Guerra. Um, and look... <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not comfortable with 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 this, but I I feel like there are things that need to be said. You, Seth, you you and Steve don't really have a relationship and aren't close on any level, but, but Steve <laughs> and I are. Yeah, we we have relationships. It's not a very good relationship, but go ahead. Yeah, well, I guess I just want it. I'll, like I'll you step back, let you talk. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, but you and I come from. Like are in different places when there's stuff like this involved, and man, I just want to be on the record. Like I, uh, Steve and I have been pretty close friends for 20 years. I love Steve like family. We have been on opposite sides of things over the last like five years, to be <laughs> particular, and it's and it's uh, been a little bit of a strain at times on our relationship. I I know Steve is hardworking and. I know that he works hard enough to deserve the Jim Tracy award. I, I, I have two takes on it. One, I have felt for a long time and I've been trying to remember if this has happened before to where an, a member of the executive board won the Jim Tracy, uh, uh, Jim Quinn award. <laughs> um, and I, I can't remember if it happened, but I, I've, I've had a burr in my saddle for, decades that i don't feel like anyone from the executive board should be nominated for the jim quinn award because the the definition of the jim quinn award is for the people who go above and beyond for the sport of beatball and i know steve garrett does that but he does it as a secretary like if if i'm the secretary if i'm second vice if i'm first vice or if i'm president I'm expected to go above and beyond. When I ex- accept that nomination, I'm telling you, people, membership, I'm going above and beyond for you. That, I wouldn't take this job if I wasn't going to go above and beyond for you. So I don't, I don't feel good about anyone 
that's taken on a role voluntarily to go above and beyond be being nominated for for these awards i i think the jim quinn award should go to somebody like nestor gonzalez who came on our show talking about how he's dragging his family out at night so he could work on equipment so that the the skills competition will go off right you know he's stuffing his entire family into a car full of equipment so that when they play in the beast of the east they'll have enough volunteers out on the field to get their games played i mean that's just one example of many in our league everybody listening to this right now listening or watching whatever you're doing you know somebody in this league that goes above and beyond uh, without being part of the board. Uh, Demetrius Morrow, uh, he's a board member now for the first time, but for years he's been on committees and promoting the league all year round. Like that kind of stuff deserves a Jim Quinn nomination, not people who signed up to do the job. So that has, that part of it has nothing to do with Steve Guerra. I'm not that, that part of it's just me against anybody on the executive board being eligible for that award. It rubs me wrong, but man, this last year has been a dumpster fire and Steve Guerra has been right in the middle of it. I'm not saying he, I'm not going to put all the blame on him, but this, this shit show that's gone on for the last six months has been surrounded around Blake Boudreaux, Steve Guerra and Darnell Booker. And it burns me. It hurts me, but I'm not even as mad as sad and hurt that Darnell Booker has lost everything he earned uh, as far as getting the first vice president job and, and something he's coveted for a long time he lost everything and got the boot and the two that that circled that that situation Blake Boudreaux and Steve Guerra are up giving speeches and winning awards at the end of it all and it's just wrong it doesn't sit well with me I I love I said already I love Steve Guerra like family and I can't even congratulate him because this situation just rubs me the wrong way and I wanted to get it off the chest I know you have thoughts too and I'll keep my mouth shut and, and let let you go with them no, I mean you, you said it. To me, it's it's the it's it's the last thing, the 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 Dar- Darnell factor. How Blake and and Steve have kind of railroaded Dar- Darnell. Um, you know, I I I've I've honestly never given much thought to the executive who who gets it out of executive or non-executive. Um, but at, at the the optics of this. Um, to to celebrate somebody who has you know and you know I'm not putting any blame on Darnell at least from what I heard right and you know I'm sure Darnell runs people the wrong way I'm I'm I, I'm sure of that so there there is some blame I'm sure he can find somewhere but at least from that situation I I I don't think that we should be celebrating these Steve and these two after we have basically railroaded Darnell so. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I, you know, I don't have a good relationship with either Steve or Blake. I used to have a really pretty good one with Blake, but, um, I don't know. He's made it difficult. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say it. Man, uh, uh, I honestly, I mean, just my last thought on it, like after everything we've gone through and, and Blake and Steve just like showing that they held all the power and, and showing the whole membership that, that Darnell had none. Uh, I, I felt like this is Blake's way of just telling us all we could kiss his big arrogant ass on his yeah. way out as president. That's the way I take this. I don't believe that, you know, even though Blake got up, was crying in his speech. Or I don't think he got, I don't believe Blake was there. We had a bit of a, a COVID outbreak. Um, oh yeah we didn't even talk about the covid yeah, outbreak of we, the World we could mention yeah. that because I, I do want to mention i had a long talk with timmy tim hibner and he, he's doing okay health wise um but i don't i honestly don't even feel that blake genuinely not made this nomination i felt like this is just him swinging his big bat around and just showing everybody that he's been the man for the last five years. That's the way I take it, take it as a slap in the face. And I, I, I just can't applaud it. I'm not going to applaud it uh, deserving or not. I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to go there. Uh, and I don't mind talking about this cause it was made public, but um, Tim Hibner came down with COVID 
at, at the World Series on Friday when they were uh, like he was up all night uh, Thursday with an upset stomach. He thought it was just he ate something bad. Um, and then Friday, uh, while they were playing the Jets, he was uh, on the decline. And I think it was Kenny Bailey uh, was asking him, he's like talking to him about his symptoms. He's like, you know, that's all the stuff I was experiencing when I had COVID. And <laughs> um, Tim's wife went and, and got some tests. And sure enough, no, both he and his wife uh, tested positive. So they ended up just climbing in their car. And they tried to get some medical attention there in Beaumont, but they were going to have to wait a day or two. So they just climbed in their car and, and drove back to Oklahoma. And they're quarantining, but they're, they're both feeling pretty good. Uh, man, this was uh, this hit home for me, uh, Seth Dog. Um, many people know that I lost a family member right before, like the Friday before uh, the World Series started. But it, it was my oldest brother, and he died of COVID. And granted, uh, he he had other things going on that affected his immune system that that helped do him in. But man, he caught COVID on Monday, went to the hospital on Thursday, and died on Friday. And so when I'm hearing about my friends out at the World Series getting COVID, like it's too close to home for me right now. Like I've never been afraid of getting COVID. I'm afraid of giving COVID to somebody that that has a compromised system and could be taken out as quickly as my brother was. So everybody that was around it and whatever just be smart please be considerate I, I don't we're not gonna have a covid episode we're not going down that road again it is what it is but man people that's our family the nbba membership that's our family we're the only ones that care about each other in this in this league so please you know just be smart and safe considerate if you're around people get tested and if you're positive you know keep keep yourself away from folks because this is still an ugly disease and I'll, and I'll just say, you know, of course, we aren't going to have a COVID episode. And and I thought it would have been the most appropriate and smartest thing for the NBBA leadership to do it would be to purchase uh, COVID tests, <laughs> right? So so you would have COVID tests up yeah, you know, on hand that yeah. actually people could take all the time. But knowing, right, the leadership and their, their slant and their bent and their ideals, there, there's no reason to to bring that up because everybody would have poo-pooed it everybody were like oh no yeah you, you know i'm a an nfb member now and though i haven't gone to the national convention the now i mean it's a lot larger that's like two thousand or more people usually oh. i think but they had all kinds of covid stuff in play that before the national convention you had to prove you um had had the whatever what, what what's the word i'm looking for seth I don't know vaccine. The, the vaccine, yeah, yeah. You had to prove you had the vaccine. They had mask stuff in play. I don't think there's anything in play for the World Series. And what you just brought up about the testing, when I heard that he tested out at the field, I was like, "That's smart. They're out there testing people on the field." You know, I was giving the MBBA credit. His wife had to go buy tests because yeah, there was right, nothing exactly. out at the field. <laughs> exactly. So uh, yeah, for me, yeah. it would have only been smart. Only been smart, but. All right. right. I'm glad to hear Timmy's doing well. Though. Yeah, 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 yeah. I love that dude. I mean, that Tim and I don't talk often, but Tim and I are very close. I I played for the Oklahoma City uh, Bombers in 2004 because of my relationship with Tim. Tim pitched for the Dogs because of his relationship with me. Nobody else there when the Oklahoma City folded in 05. There were at least two or three other teams that had sponsorship going to Tim, begging him to come on board. Teams that were closer to him than us in California. But because of his relationship with me and his belief in what we were doing out here and his belief in, in, in my leadership, that's why Tim Hibner pitched for the, the West Coast Dog. So I've got nothing but loyalty and love for that dude forever. So I don't know. Enough on that. Enough on all this, man. Uh, starting next week, we're going to be bringing in all the all the people we can to highlight them from this this past tournament and just keep on trucking set dog we are closing in on episode number 100 we're in the 90s now set dog it's crazy i love it uh, i love it keep on slipping, slipping. <laughs> all right you got anything else we out yeah we're, we're done we're all right, right. All right. Peace out, everybody. Hope everybody made it home safe, and we will catch you next week. Be well.